Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech doing an Ask Anything vlog reply. I've got several questions. I just grabbed the first few off of the thread, and I'm going to be answering those today in the vlog. But before I move on, I want to talk about the two places that I'm going to be this weekend for sure. Uh, number one is I'm going to be at EMP, the Experience Music Project. Uh, this evening, I'm volunteering with Card Kingdom there, uh, doing some indie game, board game stuff. And then tomorrow morning, uh, Card Kingdom is running a PTQ at the Convention Center in Seattle. I will be there. I'm not sure what I'm playing in. I've got a Legacy deck that I really like. I've got... I like Sealed, which is what the format is, so I'm really up in the air, whether I want to play in the Qualifier or... I also just want to trade to finish off my Mono Green EDH deck. I'm super close to having it all foiled out. Or at least uh, Artist Alters or other cool stuff done on each. A few misprints in there also. So let's jump into the questions. The first one here, I really like this question. It's a great question. I can't answer it this quickly, though. I'm going to be adding this to my list of topics. Um, I'll put a list of topics link into the uh, description. Um, I've got it linked on my page also for the channel. It's a great question, though. Which 10 non-legendary creatures do you think should be allowed to be used as commanders? There are so many of them out there. I, I just can't get to it in this short little time frame, but... That will be a video in and of itself. Thank you for that great idea for a video. Second one, will you do more top 10s? Hell yes, I love doing top 10s. Yes, I did top 10s for all the EDH uh, colors, and then for the guilds, I may do the clans at some point, and I'll do lots more lists. I like doing lists. I don't know what it is. There's something about just putting together a list that makes me focus and think about it more than just randomly ranting, which I like ranting, but that's different. Next question here is a really tough one. What are your thoughts on buying beta power or unlimited power? I need three more pieces to complete my power nine. Is it worth it buying beta? I do like the black border, but the price difference is astronomical. Let's look at what that price difference actually is, because it's crazy, crazy, crazy different. We're looking at Mox Sapphire here. Unlimited, 700 bucks. Beta, three to five grand. Wow, these guys have shot through the roof. I traded for a Beta Sapphire when I was completing my unlimited set of power, yes. And then I used that Beta Sapphire to get an unlimited Sapphire and another piece of power. It was well worth it to me at the time, but the Betas have just shot through the roof. If you have a choice between buying a house or a set of beta power, I would buy the house. Or at least put a really nice down payment on it. If you already own a house and you just want your deck to look really cool and have a long-term investment, beta power is definitely a good way to go. There's so little of it out there. It's been going up. And as long as Wizards keeps treating the paper game well, it will continue to go up in value. And the way that they even put these online has shot them up even further. People like to see these cards played. And they're getting played more now than they have been for the last several years. Next one. What is the worst card ever? Soros Path. Crazy bad card. I don't know what they were thinking. I'm sure you can come up with some great ways to use this card in obscure scenarios. But this was one of the earlier sets that I... But, and I was super excited about the Dark when it came out. They could have lands in it. That's great. I, I liked Bazaar of Baghdad and Library of Alexandria. And now we have a land that hurts us and doesn't seem to have any use. Okay. Uh, with cons of Tarkir, do you think the Sliver EDH decks are now more playable with the tricolor lands as well as the re-released fetch lands. Hell yes, they're less expensive, they're easier to get into. If you want to get into slivers, get into them now. They're reprinting slivers because people love slivers. If slivers become a competitive deck, the value of some of those could shoot through the roof. Not the tricolor lands, but some of the other slivers. Get slivers while they're in print, they're a fan favorite. They're fun in EDH. Yes, you can do broken combos with them, but you can also have a very interactive, competitive deck. Next question. Other than I own up, what are the cards that absolutely piss you off to no end and the cards that you flat out will not play against, if any? I will play against anything. And I've got a spiky blue-black deck that has counter spells, has control, puts out one threat, and grinds the game out. I would much rather play against an interactive deck. A deck that allows each person to get their strategy going, interacts with them, and hopefully wins, too. 
I should do a, a list of just the cards that I really think should be banned. There are a few that were mentioned in the comments here to this uh, last video, um, including, oh, the blinky guy, Deadeye Navigator. That guy's got to go. I, he was part of the big problem with Sylvan Primordial. It just gets abused way too quickly with comes into play effects and just runs the fun out of the game, especially with like a Mystic Snake. Mystic Snake, good card. Mystic Snake plus Deadeye Navigator, no fun for anybody else at the table. So next one, do you think 10th edition foil time stop will keep its value? It's over $90 now and all stores are sold out. That's crazy. It's only really played in EDH and Cube. It will see a reprint at some point. And although the value may stay high technically, the reprinted one is going to be worth little to nothing, and everybody is going to be able to use it any time. So I, I would not invest in that. If you have them and you're not really attached to them, I would get rid of them. they got to put it in some set somewhere. And that, that's really a lot of what's going on financially with casual cards. When they're not available, they go way up. When they're available, they crash and they take a long time to go back up. So it's a whole different market than legacy staples or standard cards. What are your... Thoughts on the Commander 14 Planeswalkers. Did a whole video on that. Check it out on my top 10. But basically, I really, really like the new Planeswalkers and the ability to cast them from the Command Zone. The particular ones that they have, I don't think are super competitive, but they're a lot of fun. They feel like they took the original cards they're based off of and rebalanced them in some way, especially with white and red, to where they're now fair cards and they're going to be great commanders. Do I think competitive EDH is a bad format? No. It's just not a format for me. If I want to play competitive, I'll play Legacy, or I'll play Vintage, or Standard. I like Singleton Online a lot, which is a lot what competitive EDH feels like, uh, but it's just not the right format for me. I personally enjoy playing a little bit more casual game. That doesn't mean that I don't try to win and I don't build over-the-top decks occasionally, but the one-on-one -on -one environment is just not what I'm looking for when it comes to EDH. Thanks, this has been Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech doing an Ask Anything. I'll definitely do these in the future. Also, thank you to everybody over there on Patreon who is supporting the channel. You guys are making all this great content happen. I've got lots of cool stuff coming. We just hit $50 on Patreon, so I'm doing a special EDH deck tech coming up here in the next week and a half.